welcome to the Standing Committee of the Premier. Uh, my name is Ricardo McKenzie, and I'm joined this afternoon to assist me in this committee. Wasima Ahmad is joining us, and Ms. Lizette Klut is also joining us. Uh, thank you for working with us on this committee this afternoon. I'm going to introduce the members an opportunity to introduce themselves, then the DG and the team, then I'll take us forward on this meeting. Thank you. Uh, members, you can start. Good afternoon, Chairperson Regan Allen. Good afternoon to the department and officials as well. Good afternoon, Chair Wendy Philander. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Cameron Dugmore. Good afternoon, Chairperson Peter Murray. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, uh, continue, any other members of the committee or members that want to introduce themselves? Okay, DJ and your team, you can introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, Chair. Um, myself, Paddy Malila, I'm the DG and also the account officer for vote one. And um, I think whoever's here in, from the department side can just proceed to introduce themselves. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chairperson and uh, members. Andre Jumat, uh, Head of the Corporate Services Centre. Good afternoon, Chair members and officials. Linda Kruetwam, Office of the Premier. I see Drickers and Rieta. Good afternoon, members. Drickers, Basom, CFO. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Members, Henry Robson, Corporate Assurance. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Members, Michael Hendrickser, PDG for People Management. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Members, Marsha Corston, Strategic Program. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson and Members, Lucas Buter, Legal Services. Hilton. And DG. Okay, good afternoon. I say uh, Michael Hendricks here, Mr. Hilton is here, uh, Gideon van Niekerk is here in the meeting. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I also see Mr. Shiraz Sassam is here and Tafsir Abbas, uh, two trusted colleagues, and uh, helping us making this meeting happen. Uh, thank you for joining us. If I miss you, you're just welcome to put your name in the uh, uh, a note so we can just uh, record your presence. Just a bit of a admin work for the start of the meeting. All members are to be muted at the beginning of the meeting to avoid background noises. And uh, points of order, if members want to flag their point of order, please do so in the MS Team chat function. Can I ask everyone, just all your videos and audio must please be switched off to improve the quality of the connections. However, when you speak, please do put on your mic, obviously, and also your video so that we know who's speaking. Um, once you finish speaking, please switch off your mic uh, so that we don't need to hear the background noise, dogs barking, people building. Um, for the agenda of this meeting has been circulated and sent out. I know that we did receive the presentation earlier on, which uh, is unlike the Department of the Premier, they're normally quite jacked up, but that's fine, we'll, uh, uh, we'll continue. Um, so I'll give the opportunity for the DG and the Department of the Premier just to brief us on their quarter performance report. Thank you very much. Uh, HOD, I'll hand over to you and your team. Thank you, Chair. Um, from our side, obviously, um, I'm sure the Premier um, tendered an apology. He's just meeting um, with some of the national ministers um, this afternoon, so you might come in and then leave the discussion um, again. Chair, I just want to see quickly um, if it works. Let me just um, go to the, um, to the presentation. Um, Chair, can somebody just confirm if it's actually um, moving or what I'll do? I'll probably just have to just I can see the first and page and just move to the next page. Um, I'm sure it's not moving. Chair, let me, let me just unshare it and, um, and share it again.
So I just want to see if you can see it, Che. Uh, yes, uh, strategic okay. content is number one. Wonderful, Che. Then um, I can I can go from here. Um, Chair, there is a context to this presentation, and maybe I just want to share that um, with the members. You will see that this presentation provides our overall strategic context. Then um, we provide you with some information on our quarterly um, performance, Chair. And then, um, more importantly, we also provide you the context to that performance, given the fact that the Department of Premier really had to um, step up and also shift some of our attention, particularly over the last um, three months. And you may recall, Chair, the lockdown started in the last week of March. And so it effectively, you know, was in operation for the entire period from April um, to June. So as a department, we had to be very agile, responsive, and also adjust some of our own um, priorities to respond, you know, as a department towards um, COVID. So this whole presentation, Chair, is actually within that um, context. So Chair, the first slide is really just um, on our context. Um, I always put this up because, I mean, this is the context of the department of the Premier. We're playing a leading role in this. And the point I will make later, Chair, is that as part of our recovery plan, we obviously also re-looking, you know, at our own PSP and then also to pull in the entire recovery post-COVID into what we're doing as a vote and also into what we're doing as a department. Chair, just to remind you about our vision, mission, as well as our um, the impact, and obviously it relates back to the initial PSP. Um, this slide just speaks to the strategic role of the Department of the Premier, premised under three main priorities. It's our guiding role, our enabling role, as well as our directing role. And you will see the part that I've underlined here is to say that we're re-looking at this, you know, post um, obviously um, COVID and also the learnings that actually comes from our entire um, COVID um, experience. So Chair, moving over to um, the quarterly performance information of the um, department for um, this last quarter. Chair, in aggregate, you can see that we had about, um, we had 44 um, performance indicators. We've achieved um, 24 of them, that's outright achievement. And then there are some of them um, that we either, either haven't achieved or just partially achieved for the, for the quarter, but it's within the context that I will deal with um, later. So you'll see Chair for the first quarter, it's uh, more or less a 55, 45% achievement vis-a-vis -vis, um, none um, achievement. It's important Chair, just in terms of our um, performance, um, for the first quarter, and just apology for that um, typing error in the in the heading. Some of our targets have not been achieved, and it's mainly because of um, COVID. Because as I said in the beginning, it required a different role from the department of um, mm. of the premier. So what has also happened nationally, some of the timelines have shifted out to allow government opportunity to respond to the onset of the pandemic. And you will even see Chair, some of the reporting um, deadlines and stuff of that has actually um, shifted. And I think um, only this coming Friday or next week, you will get the full spectrum of performance information for the entire province. And you will probably uh, more or less see a similar um, kind of picture. So internally within the vote, we had to really look at the way we deliver um, our training interventions. If you go back to our APP, a lot of them um, was basically um, aimed to be face-to-face -face engagement. And I mean, given the new approach, the new way, given COVID, we could not implement some of those um, initiatives. There are also some interventions um, that requires to be reconceptualized, given um, the recovery part, given the new recovery plan and the new way of working. And then there's also the issue around the fact that the hard lockdown particularly curbed, you know, some of our activities because some of those activities were dependent on traveling and excess seeing um, some office files. And it's particularly within the CEI space, also particularly um, in relation to our, um, our initiatives, either within this department or um, externally. And obviously the fact that, you know, we couldn't travel during the um, lockdown period also provided us with some scope, you know, to do some of the adjustments that already served in front um, of you. And then Chair, um, given also the work that we're doing in relation to our own um, focus as a management team, we had to shift what we're doing in the space to make sure that we deliver on all the issues that is actually required to be delivered. Chair, from a financial perspective, you will see that we spend um, close to 21% of our budget. This is not uncommon 
um, for um, normally um, the first quarter of, um, of any um, department. And you can see on average, um, the spending is about 21%, obviously varying you know, from about 16 to about 26% within um, Program 5. In relation to compensation, that's about 22.5%. Um, and then goods and services chair, particularly in relation to our internal responses um, to COVID, also in relation to particularly communications, you will see that we've been just over 20% um, in relation um, to that. Chair, the next couple of slides, and I'm going to run through this um, very quickly, just deals with each of the respective um, programs. Program one, obviously being um, internal. Um, you will see, Chair, that we, um, in this program, um, in particularly, um, we've achieved um, most of our targets. 75% of the um, of the targets and the respective programs or sub programs are outlined 1.5, 1.6, and 1.7. Um, then the following slides here. So what you will see for each program, I will I will put up a summary and then I will give you the detail in relation to each of the programs. You can see some overachievement also within program one. Obviously the lockdown provided us with an opportunity um, to look at our internal. Um, enterprise content management um, proposal. So staff were also given an extra opportunity, given the fact that they were in lockdown to attend some of these virtual um, training um, courses. And we've really focused on implementing, you know, um, ECM within um, the vote. In, related, in relation to the framework, in relation to the index um, being developed for the PSP chair, obviously um, the entire PSP is currently under review. And we um, termed it under the recovery plan of, of government. And obviously what we now need to do is to see to what extent does the framework that we actually plan to develop fit within the new um, recovery process. And the re entire recovery process has already um, commenced. And as you are aware, Chair, we had our first um, post-COVID um, Bosbarat um, last week and Thursday and Friday. And the subject of that um, Bosbarat was actually, you know, looking ahead, raise our heads and look at the um, recovery path. In relation to program um, two um, chair, you can also see here that most of the targets have been um, achieved. This program obviously um, deals with policy and strategy and particularly on the SMI um, space. And the um, issue under SMI is really the issue around the release of the first quarter information. And it comes back to the point I raised um, early on. Some of the deadlines have been extended by, um, by DPME and um, the first quarter report information in terms of the publication will be inco uh, in incorporated into the second quarter um, information. Chair, in relation to the problem solving methodologies, that's particularly the PDA process that we are um, looking at um, implementing um, in government, obviously depending on where we're going with the recovery plan, we will then apply um, those um, problem solving methodologies within um, those particular um, areas. So given um, that a lot of our attention have been focused on COVID, the planning, the post-recovery um, process, the policy and strategy team will now, as part of the recovery plan process, um, focus on those new initiatives that's been identified that we're going to implement post the um, recovery. Chair, there's also the issue around the Children's Commissioner, and I thought it prudent just to give you an update um, on it, also given the fact that this sits in our vote. Um, you will see that we've divided it into four areas on the administrative support side, uh, Mr. Kaya Lala takes responsibility for providing secretariat and operational support um, to the um, Children's um, Commissioner. And obviously, until permanent staff have been appointed in that space, um, that arrangement will um, continue. In terms of the establishment, um, the um, OD process has been concluded. Um, there's been signed off on the on the structure of the Children's um, Commissioner. And the next step is now, obviously, um, to decide which posts are going to be filled. And that's obviously the role that the Children's Commissioner needs to play. And then to get those posts out there in the newspaper to be advertised. In addition to this, Chair, given the new way of working, we're also making available um, some of our administrative staff to potentially also assist the Children's Commissioner to give effect to her um, responsibilities. Then for our, in terms of setting up an office from an IT support perspective, communication and physical office, um, she's taken up physical office space in Norton Rose House. I mean, that's been leased by the Department of Public Works. She has been set up with an email address chair, um, which on the screen, also in relation to her office equipment, IT, the cell phone stuff, all that stuff has been sorted. And as you're well aware, Chair, um, this year we've set aside 8 million Rand and then 5 million 
um, for each year after that. And it needs to deal with obviously the COE cost as well as goods and um, services. And in terms of the breakdown, um, the 3.1 million is allocated to cost of employment. So, so that's her own salary plus obviously the support team. And then obviously the remaining um, portion is to set up the office. And um, you will note, Chair, the 5 million is basically broken down into 3.1 plus a remainder 1.9 million for the administrative um, costs. Chair, moving to program um, three, obviously um, this is in relation um, to some of the OD work. This is also where a lot of um, changes has taken place, obviously also given um, COVID, Chair, and where we're moving in terms of the new way of working. Um, we're looking at this entire space. We've already had consultations with the PTM on this, asking questions around you know, the current OD processes that um, is moving in the departments and whether we should continue with that. We've also developed um, particular frameworks for departments to consider, you know, in relation to further OD work, as well as obviously um, the filling of um, some positions and departments um, have already responded um, in that um, um, regard. Chair, in relation to some of our key initiatives, particularly under our brand of um, culture and innovation, um, you may recall that we wanted to go down the route of um, formulating value-based leadership um, programs. Um, the initial conceptualized um, process was obviously for face-to-face -face, um, training chair. Given the COVID and the lockdown, obviously we couldn't um, do that. And we're already in a, in, in, in a process of rethinking how we're going to deliver um, some of these um, programs. And um, in fact, the, uh, the OD team have already started to roll this out um, um, but obviously on a virtual um, um, platform. Then, Chair, um, it's the same issue in relation to our annual citizen-centric culture program um, implementation. Um, again, some of these initiatives, Chair, could not be signed off before the start of the financial year because obviously the hard lockdown took place in the third week of March. And um, in fact, what we're planning to do in terms of the corrective action is to pull this into the new way of um, of working and then chair the last issue on on um, people training and empowerment obviously it's the um, implementation of the future fit skill um, strategy and then what we're also doing is um, based on um, what has happened we've already um, um, looked at the terms of reference so we've um, developed a business case and the next phase is really just to get um, the tender out there but obviously we need to take into consideration you know the recovery plan process and also the new um, way um, of working chair and then in relation to the people management practices um, this is uh, this is basically the work that we're doing you know in relation um, to departments in this area uh, most of the um, targets have been um, achieved in terms of the respective outputs where we haven't achieved certain um, targets, we will do that and implement it in the remainder um, of the year. Chair, moving on to um, program um, four, this is obviously the biggest program within um, the department. This is also one of the areas where we had to make the biggest shift to respond to the COVID um, crisis. We've already explained this um, to the committee. It's about setting up and um, getting people to work, you know, um, from home. It's about setting up our own internal arrangements to do, you know, um, the, um, the virtual conferencing, um, all the cabinet meetings and stuff that, we, um, that we've been having. So, so this team was really responsible um, for that. And then in addition to that, obviously preparing the service platform in relation you know, to the various field hospitals um, that we've um, actually rolled out in the province as part of our COVID um, response. So you can see, Chair, even in this program, it's a, it's a mix bag of, of, of responses, but there is a context um, to it. So Chair, the next three slides and just deals with um, the detail in relation um, to this. So the first part um, deals with the overachievement, Chair, um, on this slide in all three um, of the areas. Obviously, a lot of it is to do with our systems uptime because obviously we had to up our game. There's also the issue around our responses on the telephone system and then obviously how we've engaged with our citizens. Chair, you can see um, on this one, number of computer users equipped with modern office software software, we had no choice but to do it. So we had a target of 500. And um, in fact, we've almost delivered three times of on that target because um, it was a crisis and we had to get people um, um, systems to be able to talk to the office um, um, suite and then also for people to be able to dial into particularly um, the Teams um, um, platform. And then 
also chair in relation to upgrading um, our network speed sites or network speeds um, to 100 megabytes um, um, per second. You will also see chair there's also some over um, um, over performance in that area, and it's also mainly as a result of you know the response in relation to um, COVID. Um, the same issue with the public um, Wi-Fi um, hotspots, and then also the um, business solutions that's been implemented, and then also the mobile application um, platform. Then, Chair, um, in other areas, we've not been so lucky. I mean, um, the total number of Cape Access centers that's been established and managed since the inception, um, obviously, given COVID, the team couldn't travel. Um, there's also been um, some requirements on the side, side side of municipalities that they couldn't fulfill given um, the COVID um, issue. But we are confident, Chair, that we will be able to reach our um, envisaged targets, you know, if we can actually just deal, you know, with this whole issue of um, COVID. Then, Chair, um, one of the areas, obviously, that we've been impacted on um, in a big way is our training um, um, stuff. So here you can see it come it comes through. We've um, wanted to do some training, you know, um, for the citizens. 500. We couldn't do anything, and um, our training sites have been closed, given um, COVID. And then there was also the issue around the resolution rate of our contact center, and this is basically also um, given the COVID um, crisis. But um, you will also see that the staff at the contact center um, also got very busy with responding to the humanitarian crisis um, at the time. Also, Chair, in relation to our turnaround times, you can see it's more or less um, aligned to the regional target. And then um, our workspaces that's been equipped with the corporate um, Wi-Fi spots is only 344, so it's about half, because obviously we had to use a lot of our CEI staff um, and deploy them to the areas where it was most needed. Like we had to equip the entire CTICC hospital, um, the Brackengate Hospital, you know, Kailicha Hospital, and then obviously in responding to some of the other requirements, some of the staff had to be utilized um, in other areas. Chair, moving to um, corporate assurance. Um, you can also see most of the targets have been achieved in this space. Obviously, they are um, dealing with enterprise risk management, internal audit, forensics, as well as uh, legal services. And um, Chair, this slide just gives you an outline of all our initiatives. Most of them, Chair, you can see it's an overachievement on the original anticipated um, um, numbers. And even, Chair, in terms of the perception service, you can even see, you know, from a communication perspective, a lot of our communication activities were actually targeted towards providing, you know, a response to um, what is happening um, under um, COVID. So you can see, you know, all the initiatives that we've been running as a province was really to deal with the implications of, um, of COVID. Chair, the following slides um, just then details um, what um, Henriette and her team has done um, in this space. So it's around the ERM plans that's been implemented. It's also around the internal um, audit areas that's been, um, that, that's been completed. Again, um, this team has also been impacted um, given um, COVID, obviously staff in departments um, not readily available, documentation not readily available. And as I've indicated, it was really just because, um, you know, of the of the COVID issues. But um, I'm also, you know, confident that, um, you know, some of these things we would be able um, to do um, in the next um, two, three quarters that also um, remain. And you will hear also later on, Chair, there's also a team that we had to repurpose and utilize in some of the other areas, particularly as it related, you know, to the procurement of PPE and other issues relating, um, particularly pick up, you know, um, on some of the areas. Chair, I'm going to flip through the next couple of slides because obviously um, these slides will give you a good context of what we've been keeping ourselves busy with over the last three months. This is also, you know, the reason why you see um, some underperformance in some of the areas that we were, you know, um, wanting to deliver on because at the time when we put our APP together, we didn't know about COVID, but we had to adjust what we're doing as a department to effectively respond, you know, to the COVID um, issues. So, Chair, under leadership and governance, um, as you are um, well aware, there's been the additional cabinet PTM and .p exco meetings that had to be convened. This team had to do that. So it's a cabinet secretariat. It's myself as a DG, it's legal services and um, some of the other key DDGs that is responsible within some of these um, processes. 
And obviously, Chair, from where I'm sitting together with PTM, um, we had to establish the hotspot coordination as well as um, the whole of society approach. And this obviously took a lot of our time to just to institutionalize it. And um, I think from an executive level, you know, we've um, initially we had um, we met every day. Then um, cabinet met three times um, per um, per week, and then um, recently we're meeting two days um, in a week now. But those meetings, cabinet meetings, include the metro as well as all the district mayors and all the MMs. So you can see, chair, from an institutional perspective, from a leadership and governance perspective, we had to up our game um, to respond um, to it. From a policy and strategy um, perspective, obviously. It's the uh, fact that our PSP has been interrupted by um, impl implementing measures around um, COVID. Um, together with the Treasury, we've been, you know, um, sort of in the front line in pulling together what needs to go through the adjusted estimates as a first response to COVID-19. We're also taking up the leading role in um, drafting the recovery plan, as well as all the arrangements around the um, Bosbrat. And then obviously, Chair, the next issue is around how do we um, reimagine the APPs, how do we review it, you know, and getting ourselves ready for the second adjustments budget, and then also the role that DotP had to play within the VIP5 um, space. Chair, our OD team obviously had to worked very hard over the last three months on, you know, conceptualizing um, the new way of work, obviously supported by our CI um, team, as well as the rest of the HR team. And they effectively driving this whole culture change um, initiative. I've already spoken about the OD work, as well as the staff recruitment, particularly in the critical um, areas. Obviously, this team also had to help um, particularly the Department of Health in some of the areas around um, recruitment. So we've basically used the team to support, you know, in some of the HR um, issues. And then also, you know, um, taking the lessons in terms of the new um, normal um, remote working initiative. And then in addition to this, also being responsible for some of the key reporting issues um, to um, the national. On the data management side, um, Chair, obviously, um, the data team were responsible together with cabinet services and even our corporate governance team to put the weekly report together that was submitted up to national. And as far as I um, recall, Chair, and um, I mean, the national has um, confirmed this, we the only province that have actually um, reported. So we report every week and we include the cluster report, we include the hotspots report and people in this department needs to pull all of this um, together. And then obviously, Chair, also um, the communication um, to the DPSA, the communication to Cabinet, the analysis of these um, various reports, pulling together the synthesis report, and then also, you know, the establishment of the economic, um, local government, and humanitarian dashboards. So if you go onto our website, you'll be able to see all these um, dashboards. Chair, on the CI space, Hilton and his team, obviously, they had to set up all the conferencing facilities they had to make sure that people can work, you know, um, at the office and also away from the office. Um, they had to, you know, um, respond to some of the disaster management requirements at the disaster um, um, center. They had to install, you know, all the various um, facilities and they had to create wireless local area um, networks. They had to manage our virtual private um, network remote access um, activation. And then key chair is that within a short period of time, they had to ensure that about 500 key staff members um, were able to actually work um, not necessarily in the in the office, but had to work, you know, um, from a remote um, perspective. And then, in addition to that, this team was instrumental, as I indicated, you know, in making sure that all the field hospitals um, were actually capacitated and that we could do um, um, what we had, uh, what we've done, you know, in that space. And I mean, I think Premier also spoke about it early on, uh, or pre on a previous occasion, that um, these hospitals were actually. Um, paperless and um, this team actually enabled that and also particularly at the CTICC2 also enabled people to be in contact with their loved ones, you know, with their family members, you know, through using and setting up our, um, our network. I've spoken about this um, already, um, Chair, maybe just the last point that I need to mention, this team was also inter instrumental, particularly during April in responding to the humanitarian crisis that we faced um, at the time. Also, that was prior to implementing the um, 350 
HR, the um, grant within social development. Um, they were responsible to set up the call um, center. And um, at certain times, you know, during that period, we received up to 14,000 calls a day for people, you know, asking for assistance or asking, you know, for particular issues that this government had to respond to. And um, this team um, was responsible for that. In addition to that, Chair, many of our staff in this department also volunteered during that period as call center agents to respond to the cries and the needs of people out there and also providing advice to people on how to access um, the, um, the, um, the various grants from the Department of, of, um, of SASA. Then Chair, in relation to legal services, obviously initially on the interpretation of the regulations, um, the many regulations that's been issued over the last three months, they had to work through it, also advise cabinet on it, um, I mean, this team worked around the clock in terms of, you know, pulling together the frequently asked questions as a guidance to um, for government, the public, as well as local government. And then obviously also the issue around broader consultation on the regulations and directions by the national government. And then um, generally also support um, to cabinet and the HODs in responding, you know, to the many regulations and directions that's been issued. And in many cases also, you know, engage with um, other departments nationally on some of these um, issues. Chair, I spoke about the role that internal audit need to, needed to play in addition, you know, to the um, audit work. They've also together with the treasury um, formed the central advisory committee on, um, on supply chain. I mean, we've got a seat on that. Um, they've also um, assisted accounting officers with the first level of assurance um, on provision in relation to procurement of um, COVID-related um, um, stuff like PPE, and then also on the effectiveness and the efficiency and the economy of some of these transactions and in relation to some of the stuff reported directly um, to, um, to the department. Then Chair, in relation to IR, obviously the role that they play in repatriating our citizens um, you know, um, into um, back into the country, as well as also assisting foreign nationals, you know, that wanted to return to their home country. And then the key issue, Chair, that I've spoken about early on is really, you know, the work that we've done, you know, from a communications perspective in terms of the communication campaigns. The one was stop the spread, and then the other one was obviously stay safe and save um, lives. And I mean, you are aware of all these um, campaigns that's been running over the last three months, you know, on TV, adverts, radios, billboards. And in fact, on a weekly basis, we've actually also tested what is going out there and in fact, adjusted our strategy, you know, to respond to the COVID um, crisis. And then internally, Chair, obviously um, our internal staff was also important to be able to respond to the OHS um, matters. Um, I mean, we've got a, a, a very strong OHS team that also worked with the Department of Transport and Public Works, the Department of Labor, the Department of um, Community Safety, and um, obviously making sure that internally within the Department of Premier that we adhere to the regulations and that we make sure, you know, that we um, adhere to some of the protocols that needed to be in place to make sure um, primarily that our staff is actually safe and it included obviously the procurement of masks, thermometers, you know, hand sanitizers, um, etc. So Chair, just in conclusion, um, I think for the Department of the Premier particularly, um, the um, hard lockdown under, under, um, under COVID, I'm talking about the hard lockdown level five, assisted us actually in a way to prepare for the onset of COVID. Um, in the Department of the Premier, you can see that we've deployed or redeployed some of our critical staff and also reallocated, you know, um, some of our budgets in response to the pandemic. We've dealt with that during, you know, the adjustments um, budget process, but I would really say that this department have been responsive and agile and adjusted, you know, their strategy to respond um, to COVID and to pick up the leading role that it had to play in the space. And then obviously um, what we will do is uh, moving forward, we will review you know, our APP and particularly some of these um, indicators as we move you know, into the next phase of the entire budget and policy planning process. And then just lastly, Chair, we will lead the recovery plan process together with the executive. And we as a department, you know, um, we serious to set the tone for the new way um, of working. And that means that we will develop the required policies, we will work with the departments, and we will support um, the cabinet to, to make sure that we set the tone 
you know, from this department's perspective in making sure that we can deliver and actually enter into the recovery phase and make sure, you know, as a, as a provincial government that we just remain responsive, that we remain agile and that we can actually recover, you know, post the COVID-19 um, process. So, Chair, um, from my side, um, that's it. Um, and I hope, Chair, that that responded to um, the queries that you wanted us um, to respond to. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, DG, and thank you for your team. I'm going to uh, hand over to the members uh, just to take hands for a few questions before I proceed. Uh, we will take uh, uh, three hands and then your team can respond and subject to the amount of questions, we'll then consider if we take more hands. I've recognized member Dagmore, member Murray, and I presume member uh, uh, Philander in this round. Thank you. Member Dagmore. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson. Also to the DG, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it clearly does reflect a huge amount of work that has had to be done. And um, we commend the Department of the Premier and the officials for, for the efforts that have been made. I would just um, like you, th through the Chair DG, just to explain a little bit more about the components of the recovery plan. When you refer to the recovery plan, um, we know that there has been a government approach towards the pandemic resting on three pillars, the issue of prevention, secondly, the issue of social relief and then economic recovery. So when you talk about the recovery plan, is that a plan specifically for the Western Cape Provincial Government or is it a, are you talking about a broader economic recovery plan that you are now as a Department of the Premier working on? So if you could just um, explain the content um, of the recovery plan that you refer to? Is it more internal or are you talking about the overall recovery plan in terms of the three pillars of the, the COVID response? Um, secondly, um, you mentioned when you reported on the Children's Commissioner that the organizational structure had and staffing had been approved. Could you just um, either yourself or ask one of the other officials to provide a de some more detail on that? How many staff members are we talking about? And when is the actual recruitment process, uh, advertising uh, process going to commence in regard to staffing the, the Office of the Children's Commissioner? And then lastly, in regard to field hospitals, um, there was a report in the in the media um, indicating that the Hospital of Hope, um, that the capacity levels, if I'm not mistaken, were around 30% and that there was a report that in fact, the Hospital of Hope would be relocated um, to assist the Eastern Cape in setting up a field hospital there. Could you just um, give us a sense of what the current capacity is um, of occupancy levels are at the Hospital of Hope and um, other field hospitals which have been set up and whether it is uh, true that um, that field hospital will be dismantled and um, actually relocated to the Eastern Cape? If you could just um, clarify that for us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, DG. Thank you, uh, Member Murray. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I want to ask, what is the utilization efficiency of this hospital, uh, Cape Town Convention Center? I'd like to know that. And Hindsight, my proposal that we should rather have used community centers and converted them into field hospitals. Do you think it would also have cost us 12 million a month or considerably less? And then I noticed that in your in your presentation, you mentioned about this recovery plan. To what extent is your recovery plan subject to national approval? Is it your recovery plan or is it a national controlled recovery plan? And then I would like to know, it's difficult to crit criticize you. I can't criticize a man for losing a race because he's got a broken leg. <laughs> it would be <laughs> stupid to say, why didn't you run faster? Why didn't you perform better? He's crippled, he can't do it. You crippled. You don't have the authority. 
to just have a recovery plan and do whatever you like. So to what extent does this impact on the efficiency levels in the Western Cape that there is a central command who, who determines what can and what cannot be included in your recovery plan and how much funds will be made available to implement it. And then I see that in terms of people training, that has been paused. So you, 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 you're doing very well in terms of auditing and forensic auditing, internal controls. That is one thing that you can pat uh, the DA on the, on the back in terms of control systems. But have you got a plan to recover what we've lost post-COVID-19? Uh, I want to know because there's a lot of things that we have been performing very poorly on. And there's certain things I would give you a C, like forensic, or, forensic audit, internal audit, uh, risk management. I think we can give you an A. But there's others I will give you a D on. And those that I gave you a D because you failed because of external issues beyond your control, have you got a recovery plan to fix it after COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you, Member Wendy Philander. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, two questions. The one is, in terms of human resources, Chair, is there any um, support services available to staff, like counselling or bereavement services, um, seeing the times that we are currently facing, Chair? And then um, secondly, um, money is not utilised, for example, training and so forth. Um, how is the the money diverted at this point? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Philander. Um, if I can just come in also, uh, there are two issues I want to raise. One is, um, members, if you don't mind lowering your hands so that we know who's up in the next round. And then the second issue I'd like to raise is just one of the questions Member Dagmo asked on the Children's Commissioner. If one can perhaps get timelines, it's wonderful to see everything's happening. If one can just get some yeah. timelines, uh, because as you know, children's issues are quite urgent. And this, the, the last point on the questions, members, if we're just mindful of the fact, I do appreciate some of the questions that were asked, but uh, for example, the Hospital of Hope issues, those are issues that perhaps the ad hoc committee deal with, but I just want uh, to be mindful of that. But uh, but but obviously in this program, if I think remember Dagmar's context, if perhaps obviously when no one wants to know under the spending items what's happening, but there are uh, another committee dealing with the overall strategic directions when it comes to those issues. Hey, DG, you can respond. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, um, thank you, and also thanks to the members for the questions. I'm going to ask um, Michael Hendricks uh, to respond to the two questions that's been asked by Member. Um, Philander on the um, support services to, to staff. I mean, that's definitely um, in place. That's our main priority throughout this um, crisis, obviously, other than dealing, you know, with the with the citizens out there, because we can only deal with the citizens if our staff as well, but Michael can deal um, with the detail. Let me, let me just deal with the questions of um, the other members. Basically, Chair, um, we are still drafting the um, recovery plan. We had our first Bosbarat session um, last week and Thursday and Friday. Obviously, the recovery plan chair doesn't stand on its own. Um, the PSP has not been thrown out of the window, but what we've realized, so if you go back to, I think, slide number two that I've presented early on, but we realized, chair, in, in looking at the, at the post-COVID recovery, we need to look at our PSP because many things have changed, particularly in relation to the fiscal resources that is um, that is available. And given the, the cuts that's been made in the budget, how will we be able to respond you know, um, to those things? So you will remember, Chair, we, we've had five priorities 
as part of the PSP. And the hard questions that we're asking ourselves, should we still continue to have five um, priorities or are there maybe some of those priorities that we need to um, prioritize? Obviously, two things, actually three things stands out and it's actually even part of the original PSP. The one issue is obviously dealing with the um, loss of jobs, obviously getting the economy going, um, you know, um, growing the economy, but obviously creating um, jobs out there. Then the second issue is really dealing with um, the issue around safety. So you will recall that safety has been our number one um, priority. We've seen and learned many lessons, you know, over the last while in relation to how to deal, you know, with the stuff. And then the third issue, Chair, is that if people are not going to have access um, to jobs, we're potentially going to sit with a bigger humanitarian crisis on our hands that we can actually um, deal with. So what is then the response of this government? How do we work with um, non-governmental organizations? How do we work with the national government to make sure that we can actually you know, provide an appropriate response um, to the humanitarian or, or the potential humanitarian crisis? So we're looking at the whole concept of providing human dignity in relation to the key services that we're providing. And our key services, Chair, remains. It's, it's education, it's health, it's social development. But then how do we make sure that those services are delivered to create um, jobs, to make sure the economy grows, to create a safe environment, and then obviously to create um, human um, dignity. So the points I think that Minister, um, that, that Mr. Uh, Member Dugmore raised, around the components of, of this plan. It's around prevention, it's around economic recovery. And then obviously within each of those components, there will be um, leads picking up um, on each of the different um, areas. Chair, in, in relation to this recovery plan, obviously we are part of um, the broader South Africa. I mean, we get most of our resources um, from national. So we're not going to just you know, do this plan in the absence of looking at what is being developed, you know, either, um, you know, through the national cabinet process. I mean, the premier partakes in the in the PCC, that's the presidential coordinating um, council. And obviously we're looking at what's being um, developed. And in the same way that our PSP has been aligned, you know, to um, the broader plans of the country, I'm sure, you know, um, during the recovery phase that we will also look at some of um, of those um, um, issues. So we're developing it um, internally, um, Chair. I'm talking about now within um, .p. We're taking the lead, but we're not um, doing it on our own. In fact, we've already consulted more than 200 um, senior members in this government. We're consulting PTM. We're consulting um, the executive because obviously this plan needs to be approved by the executive. So we're just leading it internally, but it's an actually a, a plan that's going to be that's going to um, require the approval from um, from the executive. So everyone is actually involved in it. So in relation to the um, children's commissioner, I would actually um, propose that we submit the entire structure to the committee if they if they okay um, with that. Um, I mean, the Children Commissioner has asked me um, now to, to have a session. Obviously, we need to talk about the budget stuff and then obviously also on when are we going to commence, you know, with um, recruitment. My own take on it is that obviously the Children Commission herself needs to play a key role in that entire process, particularly with recruiting um, the professionals that needs to work within that institution. And for now, we're providing administrative support, you know, um, with our administrative staff. And I think, Chair, the other point I need to also mention is obviously the people that's appointed in the structure of the Children's Commissioner um, will basically be um, public servants. It's really just the Children's Commissioner that is a statutory um, appointment. Chair, you've already, um, I think, provided some guidance in relation um, to the field hospitals, the utilization. And I mean, I would really um, think that the Department of Health is more appropriate um, to respond to that. And as you've indicated, there is an ad hoc committee that's been set up um, to deal with all the issues. And I mean, Dr. Kluter has got um, all that information in terms of the utilization, you know, of um, the respective hospitals and also the decisions that needs to be taken um, in this um, um, regard. Chair, that also links then to the question, I think that um, that's been raised by um, by member Mare, particularly in relation to the utilization and the efficiency of these um, hospitals. I also just need to make a point that the 12 million more or less per month 
um, that's been paid for um, CTACC, that is really for the operational cost. We're not paying any rental cost to the CTICC. And um, in fact, we've used that facility or we opted for that facility, given the fact that all the other issues has already been in place. So the subterranean infrastructure, the, the, the infrastructure to deal with um, accepting um, patients, the infrastructure to deal with um, disposable um, or, or, or the disposal of medical um, waste, et cetera. And that was one of the main um, reasons for choosing, you know, um, that particular uh, facility. It's also next to, you know, the Christian um, Barnard um, Hospital. And in fact, Chair, my own view is that if we've just taken, you know, a normal community center, we then had to make sure that all those infrastructure then had to be in place. And in fact, you know, I can probably estimate that it would have costed us um, more to actually get the the, the 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 any community center to be up to standard. So whether it's you know water provision, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then to go to a, a facility that can already deal with those things. So the facility didn't cost us anything from a rental um, perspective. We've only paid for the cost that we've incurred because obviously we couldn't, you know, um, still settle that with the um, with the CTICC because I mean they wouldn't be able to to pay um, um, that cost. Chair, um, if if you're okay, I'm going to just ask um, Michael just to respond to the question of Member um, Philander. And I mean, if any of the other members want to come in and to respond to some of the issues, um, they are also most welcome um, to add. Michael. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, members again. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, uh, in terms of the uh, support to staff uh, uh, during this period of time, we have a, a service provider, Metropolitan Health, that provides so, uh, so, so psycho uh, support to, to our staff uh, free of charge. Um, to give you some idea of, of what is what is uh, being done, because these are sort of um, people can call in, uh, their, their family members can also call in and get support. Um, whether through trauma support, uh, financial support, legal support, because these are all matters that affect staff and, and their families. So just uh, to give you some, the, the reports we get is during the period since March to June, um, there were uh, 357 uh, um, call-ins by, by staff members. Um, that is now just with regard to COVID. Remember the service pr is, is provided to staff for any, for any uh, um, cause of, of, of uh, psychosocial support that they may, may require. Uh, in terms of events such as debriefings, etc., there were there were 202 such uh, support uh, provided to staff. For example, you would have group debriefing sessions, especially during a trauma. A majority uh, of, of these sort of debriefing sessions, as you could imagine, was through uh, um, sessions at, at the various hospitals um, and district uh, clinics, etc., uh, with health. Um, education also had, as well as then uh, CSC departments, there were 202 of those during the period of um, March to, um, to June. Um, and, and that serviced one thousand, just under 2,000 uh, staff members attended these uh, uh, debriefing sessions where they, pro they get trauma counseling, etc. Um, just during the month of July, um, we've had uh, um, over 1,200 uh, staff attend some of these different debriefing sessions um, that happens as again, the majority of cases uh, or, or events are taking place in, in our Department of Health. Um, uh, and then also within the CSE departments, because as 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 staff members uh, coming to contact um, and, and experience all the trauma, both of losing whether it's family members or even colleagues that they are working with, and, and just generally the anxiety that comes with with a, with a matter of, of dealing with COVID. So we have a comprehensive service that, that is available to all staff. We advertise it, we send out, uh, and we ensure that that also that 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 staff members are aware that there is this. Uh, service which is provided to them uh, uh, free of charge. Um, there was another uh, question with regard to training. Um, primarily what we have done is that um, the training uh, that, for example, a department will budget for, so it's not within our space that the budget is, so departments will reutilize the training if they are not sending their staff, for example, to Cromery. But what we have done at, at Cromery, uh, which has been identified as a potential uh, Q and I site as well, given the fact that there is accommodation there on 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 at Cromaria as well. So that has has also meant that we cannot uh, accommodate any 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 training that that requires staff to stay over. But what we're doing is we are busy converting um, uh, our, some of the courses we provided there 
onto online. We've done eight so far already. We, in other words, uh, it allows then staff to uh, be able to, to go online and, and do this training. We're also working closely with the National uh, School of Government in terms of their online courses that they are also providing. So uh, we, we're pick, taking up the slack uh, in terms of um, face-to-face -face training by converting courses into um, online courses that, that staff can then access. Thank you. Chair, Chair that Thank I you. think deals in with the questions. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask a follow-up question Bibi, before I hand over to my colleagues, and this particularly was regards to the Ombudsman. And uh, another Ombudsman, I'm thinking about the Ombudsman uh, uh, with regards to the Children's Commissioner. Thank and you. it's from my time when I served on another committee in the previous parliament uh, when the Ombudsman office was set up. And I know practicalities, given we are now in COVID-19, is much more difficult. Things as simple as buying stationery when the office when the office was set, uh, first set up. What is the administrative, uh, uh, um, let's call it delegated or budget authority? Uh, what is the discussion? Where is the discussion currently sitting between the Children's Commissioner and either yourself or the CFO? to ensure that office function optimally. I remember during the Ombudsman period when that office was set up, and I think we were, we were having a pe people who was here, and members of this committee was here before, one wants to avoid getting to that stage, that frustration creeps in in the appointed person, in this case, the, the Ombudsman, because staff are not being appointed, office space, a telephone, really simple things that at the time that I felt as a member of that committee didn't have to get to that level. You know, why would, should we be worried about uh, Advocate Busi because he doesn't have an office line, for example? Really simple things at the, I felt at the time as a member of the committee that should never have gotten to our level. Where are we at this point to avoid these things coming to us in two, three months where we have a frustrated Children's Commissioner because staff was not appointed at that point, uh, uh, um, at that time four and a half years ago, that the Ombudsman felt they were not involved in the appointment process of staff. Uh, is there a bi-weekly meeting, uh, 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 whether Zoom or MS team, where these things get discussed? To, to us, having had having a few people on this committee who've now served there before, and we set up our office from start many years ago, to avoid things coming to us in three months' times mm. uh, in dealing with these administrative issues. Where are we at this point in that? And then uh, uh, any other question on the Children's Commissioner before we move forward, members? Nothing else? If you can just respond on those, please. Yeah. Chair, I can maybe ask Marshall also just to, to add on, but at the moment, the Children Commissioner is a sub-program within Program 2, which is one of our programs, strategic, strategic programs. Mr. Kaya Lala, um, who's responsible for priority programs, is taking direct responsibility to deal with matters of the Children's Commissioner. So in my own discussion with the Children's Commissioner, in fact, myself, um, I met with, uh, I think, two or three times. Myself, herself, and the Premier also met once. So she's got an open door to Mr. Lala. So anything that she needs, she can go to Mr. Lala. So as an example, Chair, we've already set her up with a, with a laptop because that was the first requirement. We arranged that. We've already arranged for her to have a, an official cell phone. We've already arranged with her um, for office accommodation um, down in um, Norton, um, Norton House. Um, and then obviously just setting up her office administrative support is also provided um, through one of our own administrators, ad administrators. And if there's any other issue that she needs, she knows that her first line of call is to Mr. Lala. So any procurement matters for now, um, happens through Mr. Lala's um, um, office because obviously that is where the budget um, um, sits, um, um, Chair. And then the next big thing that might come um, is definitely on the appointment of, of staff. That is why, you know, um, our position at this stage is that um, in relation to the administrative staff, and when you see the, the organizational structure, Chair, you will see that um, I think they've only got like two professional staff um, members, and then the rest of the staff members, um, that's in addition to the Children's Commission, the rest of the staff members really deals with administrative issues to support the professional staff. And um, we've indicated to the Children's Commissioner that um, we can provide that administrative support internally within the vote, given also the new way 
um, of, of working. Early indications from the Children's Commissioner, and I mean, I must now still have my session with her, Chair. In fact, we've um, communicated via WhatsApp um, two days ago where we agreed that we now need to meet. My office will we'll set it up and we call it a catch-up, formal catch-up between the accounting officer um, and herself. Um, the, the, I think the initial request now from her is to, to, to try and appoint her director you know, the professional staff, and then somebody that can assist her directly in her office. That is the, the, the immediate requirements. In the absence of that, obviously, the immediate assistance, we can provide the administrative um, um, support. Chair, but I think you can be, you can be assured, and I mean, um, I think even in the messaging, um, the Children Commissioner must know that if there's anything that she needs, she needs to bring it to the attention of um, of Mr. Lala. Obviously, there is a major thing, but we'll probably deal with that in the new cycle. It's it's always the issue around budget, and I mean, I've been quite clear yeah. with the Children's Commissioner. Um, we've got eight million um, this year, five million for the general staff, three million to set up her office. If we're not going to set it up fully, some of that money might roll over. But on, on an annual basis, she's got five million rand, and she needs to decide how she uses that money to actually achieve. The objectives as set out in the um, in the legislation. So that's my arrangement with her as the accounting officer chair. Thanks. Okay, Nathan. Uh, thank you for that, DG. As as long as, like you say, you are in communication, there's a clear process in communication. Yeah. Because what one people will forgive us during lockdown to say there's been a lockdown, people couldn't set up. You know, the people are very forgiving. Uh, but in two or three months' time, if these things are not set up, people are going to say, Patrick. Ricardo, you've given six months. We, you know, there was a lockdown. So once he needs to be mindful of that, so that uh, if another member in in two months' time, all of us are are in a uh, George for a completely different matter, and people are going to stand there on a podium and say, "But the Children's Commission has been set up. That this party is not doing that. That party is not doing that. No one can get hold of the phone line." And ultimately, it'll come down. To a conversation in this committee in three months time uh, uh, but thank you and I'm, I'm happy that you guys are on top of it and uh, and taking this further hopefully one can get it, all the administrative issues as soon as possible a uh, member Philander and Maria is it on this matter that your hands are up or on other matters no it's a new question chair okay thank by you so this my case one question was never answered and I okay, would like Maria. to know why I see I asked the utilization efficiency of the of the hospital, the Cape Town Convention Center. In other words, the total number of beds that you pay for every month and how many of those are used percentage wise. So how much of those infrastructure do you actually use and how much is just standing vacant? I want to know what is the utilization efficiency of that hospital? Thank you, Member Maria, for that question. I think we're extremely privileged. We've got Member Wendy Philander with us in this meeting, who's a chairperson of the Health Committee, and she can certainly take that matter further um, with the Health Committee, uh, which was, who's got direct oversight of it, and the Ad Hoc Committee as well. Uh, member Philander, you got a further question? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Member um, Maria is more than welcome to the committee. Chairperson, my question relates to the pay interns. What is the um, standing operating procedure at current with regards to those that are part of that program um, this year? Will they be afforded the opportunity next year? Um, if the department can just um, brief us on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And can I also add one point to the question, please? Man. Uh, thank you, Member Philander, for the question. Um, those that qualified last year that were supposed to start on the 1st of April, uh, and they couldn't start for obviously for COVID-19. Is there going to, if Mr. Uh, Jumat or Mr. Hendricks can just share with us, is there going to be a new process for next year? Or will those be, as member uh, Philander asked now, what's going to happen with that a completely new process? Will those be reconsidered? If you can just share with the committee what is that uh, going forward? And then um, uh, members on this round, any other questions? Okay, if you can just respond to those matters in the meantime, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Michael, will you um, deal with that? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Member. Uh, with regard to the pay project, yes, what has happened is that um, a number of departments have indicated that they cannot take in the pay interns this year, uh, given the fact that you need, obviously, 
firstly one you don't want to bring young people into the 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 the, the issue secondly it was was the availability of mentors and supervisors because people may themselves be either working from home or, or working on rotation um so I think I stand corrected, uh, members. I think there are five, five or six departments who said they're not going to roll out this year. Um, it, uh, health has uh, taken up their interns because they're using them primarily in the administrative space so that they can free up other other stuff. If there's another uh, um, another three departments that are indicating that they are willing to have, but at a, 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 a largely reduced number. Um, and we're hoping that PTM will give us a, a go here to just to have a, a, a shortened pay project uh, this year. In other words, it'll be, uh, it will only be over a six month period. Obviously, we'll, we need to convert some of the training. Um, so yes, uh, what is the, the situation now is unfortunate that with everything, there's gonna be sort of a, 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 a the group that was would have been this year, together with a group that would be matriculating this year would be also then we're also wanting to look at, and 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 we haven't actually made a call on in terms of whether you are reserved to go forward, uh, because we did change the the, the intake uh, thing to, to say you're not necessarily only from the previous year, but but uh, two years. So there is a possibility. What we we may have, Chair, and I speak under correction again. We may say to people, everybody has to reapply because you want to also give the the current crop, you know, the ones that are currently in matric, who may even be. Yeah. So, uh, and also because a lot of times young people change the email address and cell phone. So even if you had it in, in, in April, you, you, you may not have it. So we may have a situation where we simply open it up again. Uh, and depending again on, on what is what is the situation with COVID for, for the next financial year, uh, um, so that we can have uh, um, a, a large intake uh, for, for the next year. But for now, uh, um, it's only basically health that has run the, 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 the project uh, and the other about five or six departments have said no, they're not going to do it in this financial year. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Member Flanda, any follow up question on that? Nothing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I just ask those that were supposed to start on the first, was there any contract started, assigned, for example, February or March with those? And is, will there be any legal obligation towards the government? If we don't take those in, obviously COVID-19, I think everyone can understand, uh, but if we don't take them as part of next year's project, for example, you know, when you have a contract of employment uh, and, and I sign a contract to say I must start next week, and for whatever reason, I can't start next week. Uh, is there a legal obligation from the government towards those individuals that were supposed to start? Um, if Ma I may. Michael, I think, you can, yeah, I think you can deal with that because, I mean, this question is something that um, that came up. And then maybe also explain to the committee what has happened in some departments and in other departments. Yeah, um, can I just say that in, in terms of our, our, our recruitment process, what happened was that the recruitment process was never concluded. In the oh, only okay. the, the only place where it was, in fact, concluded, chair was in I think in health, where they actually offered okay. not everybody, but some of those young people actually got contracts. In the other cases, they were simply said, "Listen, you have been identified by." agriculture you have been identified by whatever uh, and and we will let you know and then we okay. did send out again communications to all of them saying unfortunately given the covert uh, pandemic and the lockdown at the time we are not we are not uh, uh, proceeding now and we will uh, you know uh, yeah so so there wasn't uh, it was i think uh, again it was only health and and it wasn't a lot but they actually gave contracts there in the other departments there weren't uh, uh, contracts uh, issued thanks okay no, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Member Maresi, your hand is up. No, sir, I've given up on getting an answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Member Maret, I'll respond in committee to you. Um, then I just had a one more question from my side. On slide number 15, I think I made a note here. On uh, 15, um, on slide number 15, uh, um, under quarter one, program two, 2.2.3, uh, the target was three and it was zero. And the reason for the underachievement, it says at least three policy areas have been identified, linked obviously to the PSP and the, rec and the recovery plan. And then the corrective action, the application of methodology in these areas will commence post recovery plan. I, sorry, I, did, I don't understand. I'm going to be frank with you. Chair, um, why we've got zero there, I'll, I'll just explain to you, because if you look at the indicator, the indicator says number of identified policy areas where problem solving methodologies are applied. 
yeah. what I said in the response, we, we've already identified the, um, the number of policy areas where we want to apply the problem solving methodology. But given the fact that we are re-looking at our PSP in relation to the key areas, we will reassess whether those areas that's been identified remain still relevant and that those areas are going to be taken up in our um, recovery um, recovery plan. So we've identified them and it's basically linked to the PSP. So it's in the safety space, it's in the public um, transport safe space, and then also within the infrastructure space. But what we're saying is when we're going to want to apply the methodology, we just want to make sure that it's aligned to the recovery um, plan, which we're currently um, um, putting together. That's effectively what, um, what I'm saying. So we've identified them, but we haven't applied um, the methodology as yet. And that is why we said um, we didn't um, perform on that particular um, indicator. Okay, I understand your explanation to, to an extent, but it says here, the reason for the underachievement, at least three have been, I can understand you saying three has been identified, uh, three yeah. policy areas has been identified where the methodologies must be applied, right? So that was three. Yeah. And you've achieved zero, but you're saying the reason for the underachievement is heading. At least three have been identified linked to the PSP, and I presume those have, those are obviously that has not been done. Yeah, correct. But what was the reason for the underachievement? Ch Ch it's basically um, the fact is that we didn't want to apply it in those areas because we were not sure that those areas were still going to remain as part of the recovery um, um, plan. So if I take um, one area as an example, if I, if I say infrastructure, um, there might be a new um, problem that we want to tackle in terms of the PDIA methodology. Okay, so we also want to keep our, we also want to keep the space open to potentially have new areas within the recovery um, plan process. The other issue, chair, and I mean I didn't put it on there. It's also on the issue of um, of COVID. I mean we've we've started to have the recovery um, discussion, plan discussions as early as um, probably around middle um, middle May under the under the strategy component of our entire COVID response. So partly, it's also partly um, COVID. And then obviously, I mean, generally people are not um, are not available to actually talk yeah. through these things because the PDA methodology also requires people to generally be in the same space, in the same room to work through exactly, you know, what the problem is and then to try and find solutions in terms of the fishbone to each of those respective um, problems. So it's a combination of looking ahead in terms of the recovery plan, as well as obviously the implications of COVID, and then also making sure, you know, that the stuff is fully aligned to the recovery plan that's linked to the um, to the PSP. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I served on the Standing Committee of Public Accounts, and I think you've appeared in front of us quite a few times <laughs> when I was there, and I always said, you know, uh, when I read these documents, I don't have the privilege of having you in the room. I have to make up my own mind as to what you, what were you thinking. It was always nice when you get explanations in committee, but when you read it without individuals in the room, it's, sure. it's much more difficult. Uh, Member Ray, did yeah. your hand go up again or was that from earlier on? Thank you, sir. The recovery plan seems to bother me also. I wonder if you'll give me another bite at the apple. Okay, uh, you can go ahead. This recovery plan that you're speaking of, to what extent is it led by economic factors? What can you achieve in the recovery plan that doesn't need the finance which you don't have? Are you talking of a Marshall Plan type of thing like happened after the Second World War? Or are you hoping that uh, you might get the money to implement a plan which you have formulated. What comes first, the plan or the money? So I would like to know this recovery plan. Yeah. Che, can I respond? Uh, you can continue, Mr. Malila, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, Che, che it's, a, it's a combination of the two. So what we're doing from a fiscal perspective or fiscal perspective, we assuming that um, firstly, the allocations that's been, that's in the budget, you know, for the years moving ahead, that will remain um, intact. In fact, we're going a little bit further because the, the economy is under pressure, under tremendous pressure. And we're actually 
you know, already accepting that we might not get the same kind of finances. But notwithstanding that, Chair, we need to put a plan together to say, how are we going to recover post-COVID? Um, Obviously, I think what Member Mare has raised around the um, economic um, um, plan being part of the recovery plan, that is a key component of the recovery plan, Chair, because if we're not going to be, if we're not going to get the economy to grow, we're not going to be able to create jobs. That has got obviously um, kind of added um, consequences because then it means that you're going to put um, your tax revenue under pressure. People are not going to contribute. You know, the buying power of people are not going to be there and people are not going to be able, you know, to, to actually procure goods and services. And effectively, you're going to sit with a shrinking economy and a shrinking fiscus that will again impact on the fiscal position of, um, of this province. So, Chair, so this um, recovery plan will have a couple of components. One of them will definitely be um, the economic recovery plan. Um, that will obviously be underpinned by a fiscal um, 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 plan. And then obviously from a service delivery perspective, the other areas that I've highlighted, you know, around um, particularly the issues of, of education, health, social development, but under the broader umbrella of creating a safer environment, um, growing the economy and providing, you know, a, a a human or humanitarian response so that people have human dignity in the entire process. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Mr. Manila, for that response. I think members post uh, a 17 in committee meeting, we will also, we will be writing to the Premier and the Department and obviously once they've done this, uh, the, the recovery plan to come and do a presentation to us. Uh, members, any other question for uh, Mr. Malila and his team? Chairman, no, yes. Chair. I okay, got a question. You. Final okay. one. Member no, Murray, yeah. And then Mr. Yes. Duffman after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we have the situation that the money given to provinces is in terms of a formula, equitable formula that decides which province gets how much money, whether it is a conditional grant or whether it's ring fence money or what. Are you talking about a uh, ring fence money, which will give you a bigger share depending on the size of the impact that COVID-19 had on your province, or are you merely want to top up of what you used to get? Or are you looking at a special allocation, which is uh, in terms of the negative effects and economic impact which COVID have? had on the Western Cape. Is that part of the recovery plan? We want the recovery plan to address the impact of COVID-19, or do we just want to top up on our usual equitable share? Okay, um, Mr. Dagmo, and uh, uh, Member Mare and Mr. Malila, and I know Mr. Malila come from Treasury. I don't want us to get into philosophical discussions about the equitable okay. share and those issues, uh, because that's just a debate that I'm also very passionate about, and we can go be here for hours. Uh, Member Dagmo, your question? No, Chair, I just indicated that I didn't have a further question. As you know, I'd like to raise something at, in the yeah, latter no, part of the agenda, yeah, no, but course, I don't have I a further question. Um, uh, Mr. Marela, do you want to quickly respond to Mr. Honorable Marela before we conclude you and your department session? Yeah, Chair, I mean, I would not like to go um, down that stream. I mean, you are aware of the frustrations, particularly within the fiscal um, space. Um, we brought it to the attention of our colleagues at National Treasury, as well as national government, in terms of the implications of COVID, just from a resourcing perspective. You are also aware that um, we didn't receive, you know, the um, the required um, funding. And I mean, you've gone through the adjustments budget process, so there's no need for me, you know, to repeat what has gone through that process. Obviously, the recovery plan looks ahead. Okay, it looks forward. Um, we raise our heads a little bit and we look beyond um, COVID. And as I've indicated, the financial plan will be part of that chair. I cannot anticipate how the fiscal framework will look like or how it will pan out. The only thing I can 
say here, and I mean, it is, it, it, it's public knowledge that the national fiscus will be under tremendous um, um, pressure. There will be tremendous um, shortfalls in tax revenue. And by implication, those things will impact provinces given the current fiscal framework and fiscal um, environment. But how, what the implications will be for us as a particular province, I mean, I cannot anticipate that except to say that we all will have to tighten our belts and we will have to make it very, very tight. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Marila and your team and uh, uh, for coming out and uh, uh, sharing your uh, report with us, committee. Uh, we will make any further recommendations and we'll send it through as a, as usual. And obviously, just thank all the, uh, the department officials, uh, the call center staff particularly, and all the frontline officials uh, during this time who's consistently just get up and just do it, as the Nike slogan says, <laughs> during a very difficult time. And a belated happy Women's Day to all of you, except Mr. Malila and the other gentlemen on here. <laughs> But to your spouses and your wives, your mothers, and all of those, obviously, for them. And yeah, thank you for, and, and keep on fighting the, the good fight and making sure that you deliver to the people of this province. We do appreciate it, and we don't say it all the time, but thank you very much. Uh, you are excused. Thank you, thank you very much. And also to the um, able little um, dot P team. Thank you. All right. Thank you, um, members. Uh, we just need to member, uh, Dagmar wanted to, uh, uh, well, we're going to put it under general. We're just going to go through the normal program of the committee. Um, I'm just going to uh, um, first going to be, before I get to the resolutions and the actions later on, uh, we're going to go to the minutes of the 24th of July. The minutes were circulated by our, uh, our, our ABLE uh, uh, committee chief, Wasima. That meeting was on the, it says 24th, but I know it was on Friday the 23rd, am I right? Wasima, are you with us? Wasima? Okay. Are you there? I, I am here. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, it's the 24th, okay. yeah. Uh, members, the, the minutes are up on the screen. Just make, check your attendance on page one. Uh, yeah, page two. Thank you, you can go down. Do we have a mover and a shaker for this report? Can we have a mover and somebody to adopt the minutes of this meeting, please? Wendy Philander, Chair, move for adoption. Thank Seconded. you. Seconded. Thank you. Thank you, Member Seconded. Dagmore. Yeah. And then we continue. Wasima, can you put up the, the draft committee program, please? Thank you. You can go to the second and next page. We're here on the 12th, and we've done the minutes of the 23rd. Those are the draft programs. Uh, before we continue, on the 2nd of September, Member Dagmar, you wanted to raise the matter under general, particularly for the program. That's why I will raise it here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chair. I think all of us are I'm aware of the fact that the Premier made a public statement um, in regard to the lifestyle audit, um, which had been conducted by a private company. I want to request that um, the committee invites uh, both the Premier and the company that administered the lifestyle audit um, to appear before the committee. Okay, that should be fine. Uh, yeah, anything else? 
Members, anyone's got an objection to this? No objection. That's oh, who's playing music in the background? Anything else, members, on the program that you want to include? Nothing else, members, so I can continue with agenda on this particular program. Procedure. OK. If I, if I'm, sorry. Yes, uh, Member Mare. Uh, Premier, I don't know whether I uh, uh, speak, whether I should, I don't know if I'm speaking uh, out of turn here, but um, I'm worried about this recovery plan, and that is something I would like us to say that we, there's going to be greater discussion on the recovery plan in itself. Uh, we, uh, we, we've got to give our inputs here. Uh, recovery, what, where is it going to focus on? What part of our budget do we want to focus on? I would love that to be included, please, Mr. Chair, with the okay. uh, permission of the committee. I think that's perfectly fine. So we will have a presentation on the recovery plan by the Premier and his team, and just to come and share that with the committee. And then obviously we'll write to the Premier and see when his team and this company is available to include them on our program. We know where we have space available in the next two weeks and so that they can come and brief the committee. I also would like the reports to be submitted before the time so we can prepare ourselves adequately for that. Are you okay with that, members? Yes, Chair. I think I would support what Honourable Murray has requested and also have you recorded that the there was a commitment that we would be given a full report on the proposed staff establishment of the Children's Commissioner, the yes. time frames in regard to when those positions will be advertised, um, that is also a report that the DG indicated they would provide. If we could just record that specifically. Well, I was actually going to come to that point itself, but it's fine. We can raise it now because I did make notes for myself. Um, Wasima, yes, we just need to get the, the, the staff establishment. Uh, also, the, the, the full report, including timelines and on the staffing requirements and uh, or other physical requirements like offices, um, uh, or rather call it administrative requirements. And also just to give an indication who's currently seconded uh, to that team to work with a children's commissioner, obviously what level they at, uh, is it a deputy director, assistant director, and what other support? I mean, it's, I saw they indicated the children's, uh, children's commissioner at Western Cape, pp.gov.za. Uh, do they have a toll-free landline number? Just the, the, the latest status report on the Children's Commission. If they can just share that with the committee as soon as reasonably possible. Uh, Member Dagmar, your hand up? No. Uh, members, anything else that I might have missed uh, for recommendation during the meeting? Thank you, members. Our next meeting is on the 2nd of September, 21st of September, and then November and December. That will probably be our budget periods. Uh, we have made recommendations, and I'll write, obviously, to the Premier and his team to come before the committee, including the, the, the company uh, mentioned. I think it's called Nexus, Member Dagmore, you said? Well, I think it's what it's called, yeah? I'm not sure of the name of the company, Chair. Uh, I think uh, I read somewhere, I think that's what it's called. And we will ask them, obviously, for a copy of, uh, of that report, and we will make sure that the date that the committee can meet uh, them available at the earliest convenience to come on and present that to the committee. Thank you, members. Anything else? Um, no, Chair, so, so have you agreed, have the committee agreed on that particular date that uh, Wasima put on the screen? Uh, well, that's our date that's unavailable, but obviously we need to see when they're available. One needs to be reasonable as well, but I'm sure they can make it. I can't speak on their behalf, obviously, uh, but, but that's our extend, date. Yeah, Chair, I just wanted to ask, will we extend a request for that date as a committee? 
we'll extend, we will give them our days the 2nd and the 21st of October. And obviously we want the recovery plan as well, uh, but we will give them those two days, yes. Thank you. Well, Sima, did our uh, days for the Public Service Commission go out yet? Have they confirmed um, themselves? Chair, no, we haven't uh, okay. sent them any. That is just a draft program and members had to be in agreement with the program uh, unless there was other things they wanted to um, prioritize. Um, okay, cool. no problem. Members, anything else on uh, that you'd like to raise at this meeting before we close this meeting for the day? I just want to raise and say changed. I'm so happy. I would like to say to the members present here, I think you are all contributing valuably to, to this debate, and I pray that God will protect you and that you will maintain the good health I see you are obviously in. I think we got to give each other a bit of more love and more support because we're living in special times. Thank you, Member Murray, and we wish you all Thank the you best. Thank you, Member Murray. Well. Those, that's, those words Thank are you. greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Member Murray, and wishing you all good health and happy Women's Day, if I didn't wish you yet, and please to your spouses. Women's this Month. Meeting, women's, women's Month, Women's Year, Women's Century. Uh, um, <laughs> I wish you all of the best with the rest of the rest. Uh, this meeting is now officially adjourned. Thank you very much, members. Enjoy the rest of the day.